Hello, everybody. This is David. David Levin from the State Department. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate your flexibility in terms of changing some times. Um, Shaz should be here momentarily. She is en route back from Richmond. I think she's probably about 10 minutes away. But um, we thought we should start nonetheless. Um, Jordana Enrich, are you with us today? I am. Uh, wonderful. Good. Uh, Jordana is the director of, of the U.S. student program at IIE uh, for Fulbright, which is great that she's joined us. Um, I think all of you know that the funding for the chapters um, is funding from ECA through IIE uh, via a subgrant to the FA. So IIE has a clearly important role to play in, in, in all of this. Um, I'm wondering before we start, uh, maybe people can just chime in. I'm curious to know uh, how many of you are online and, and from what chapters. Um, can people tell us that, please? <laughs> I'll start. Bob Shaw from Rhode Island. Okay. Uh, I'm Tim Austin from the Pittsburgh chapter. From which chapter was that? Hi there, everybody. Pittsburgh. Huh. Pittsburgh. Okay, good. This is Kristen Swanchera from Minnesota. Wonderful. Great. This is Paula Faulkner from North Carolina. Good. Brenda Hargrove from North Carolina. Okay. Laura Miller Daniel. from Wisconsin Lacrosse. This is Daniel Glazer from San Antonio. Okay. Andre LaRock from Andre LaRock from New Mexico. From which chapter? New Mexico. New Mexico. Wonderful. E. Duke from Nebraska. Okay. Diddy Long from Arkansas. Uh, we I think we heard a couple of you at the same time. Hello, this is Amelia. So whoever just did that, repeat that. This is Kent Spring from the Oregon chapter. Oregon. Hi, I'm in Okay, our audio was not great. Jeffrey, Jeffrey from the Michigan chapter. Okay. I'm Elaine Potaker from Elaine Potaker from the Maine chapter from Nebraska. Right. Did you hear that? From the Maine I did. Um, anybody else? Uh, this is Bruce Parker from New Jersey. It's D.D. Long who needs to move himself. New Jersey. Okay, good. Okay. Anybody else? I think we have everybody. Ann Olson. Yeah. Good. Maybe there'll be more people as we go. Um, this, uh, this is Ann Olson from the Wisconsin chapter. In Madison? Yep. Great. Excuse me, could you please introduce yourself and also the woman from IIE? I did not catch her name. Yes, uh, I'm David Levin. Uh, I'm with the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, and I'm the liaison between the Bureau and the FA. And Jordana, should I let you introduce yourself? I'm sorry I didn't hear that. I was inviting Jordana introduce herself if she would like. Okay. Did we lose her, perhaps? <laughs> um, Jordana Enrich from IIE. Um, she's the U.S. Fulbright Student Program Director. Uh, works closely with me on FA activities. Um, she was on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Jordana, can we, can, are you here? Yeah, can you hear me? I, I can barely hear you. Um, I can hear you. Could you spell your name, please? So, I'm Jordana. If you can't hear me, I'll try logging back in. 
We can hear you. We can. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, I'm Jordana Enrich, and I um, am the director of the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program, and I work at the Institute of International Education, and I um, manage the agreement between IIE and the Fulbright Association. So, as David mentioned, the money comes from the State Department, flows over to IIE, and then we facilitate an agreement where we then give the money to the Fulbright Association and it then goes to the chapters for some of your chapter grant activities. All right. Um, wonderful. Um, I think we can start. Um, oh, I haven't introduced myself. I'm Amelia Montez. I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And um, I was a Fulbright in 2017-2018. And you're part of the chapter in Nebraska? Yes. I'm on okay. the board of the chapter in Nebraska. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So have we heard from all the chapter reps? Sorry, I hadn't. I joined like 10 minutes late. My name is Alana Deludi. I'm the president of the Rhode Island chapter. Um, Treasurer Bob Shaw is also on this call. Great. I'm there. Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, well, again, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we wanted to talk a bit about uh, the competition that's opened, uh, give you some right. guidelines, talk a bit about how things have changed to some extent, but maybe perhaps less than you would think in terms of how this was organized. Uh, previous years and what we're looking for this year um, and hopefully this will help you as you craft your proposals. Um, I want to see, there's a first slide that can, can everyone see the um, slides successfully? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Good, good. So the first slide I, I have talks a, about... I have a question. Yes. Um, will we be able to have access to the uh, PowerPoint slide afterwards? Yes, I understand. Not only the PowerPoint slide, but we're also taping the uh, audio as well. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to to um, sort of clarify a bit or, or, or talk a bit about more about what Chaz has provided here, um, which he talks about... Um, a change in focus. Um, because of where the funding is coming from, the particular year the funding is coming from, we're asking for this, for the next academic year, to have more of, of a focus specifically on U.S. alumni interests. Um, which doesn't mean that you can't do activities for visiting students and, and, and or for students and visiting scholars, but what we, what we suggest is any activity that you're planning to submit asking for funds from ECA is to ask yourself or for that matter ask your American alumni is this activity of interest to you um, and that's that should be a, a primary objective um, it's certainly fine for you to invite visiting scholars foreign students to any activity that you do and there's funding in the grants for that to happen but we specifically though ask that you when you look at activities that you're seeking funding for from us, that the activity is of clear interest to the American alumni. Um, I don't know that I have any specific examples of things you may have done in the past that were um, only of interest to the to the visiting Fulbrighters. Um, there may have been some, uh, but it seems like in certain ways you can tweak an activity so that it's of interest both to your American grantees your American alumni and your your visiting grantees. Um, when you think about activities for Americans, and I think lots of what you suspect you'll be doing, we had called receptions. Now we're saying please use the phrase networking. Um, but it seems to me anything that you're doing that's that's a network kind of activity, uh, like a reception, clearly ought to be of interest both to your your American alumni and your um, your visiting scholars and your foreign students. Um, and it seemed to me that's, that's 
an important part of what uh, probably all of you have done throughout the year, whether it's something that you're doing as a welcoming activity or whether you're doing something at, at a holiday point in time or um, or as your visiting grantees are finishing their assignments. Um, excuse me, that's, that's probably a... Um, an almost routine and standard kind of thing that you're doing um, throughout the year. Um, next slide. Uh, if you talk about other kinds of things that, um, again, that you're that you're you're doing um, on behalf of your U.S. alumni, some of the things I hope some of you are already doing them. Things that we've suggested that you do in the past. Uh, I know, for example, um, some of your chapters are involved in the, what we call the Young Professionals Network, where you're doing activities for, in a sense, sort of the recently returned U.S. student alumni. Um, we know that happens in Washington. It's happened in New York. I think Atlanta has done that. Perhaps some of your other chapters, uh, where you're thinking about how could we be of service to these young alumni, whether it's mentoring, whether it's providing some kind of workshop that focuses on a local industry, um, whether it's speakers who are in specific fields, which might be of interest to the young alumni, um, whether it's a seminar on resume writing, um, you know, think, think creatively about how you can engage these young alumni. Um, part of what we're talking about when we talk about Activities that are that are of interest to the Americans, to, to your U.S. alumni. We're talking about um, activities that would that would have interest them, and also activities that, in a sense, help your chapters grow, um, and for that matter, help the, the national association grow. So, are there activities that you're thinking about or that you've done that sort of go hand in hand with maybe recruiting alumni to join the, the local chapter, join? Uh, in a, for that matter, the national organization. Um, things that you could be doing that would be of interest to them that maybe helps you broaden the, you know, the base of, of American alumni who've joined your organization. And I guess the other point I should make is when you think about that, um, remember that, that membership is also open to people who are not necessarily alumni, but are defined as supporters or friends of the program. So, um, you know, there may be activities that are equally of interest to them, um, and there's no reason why your alumni can't encourage their colleagues or friends to become engaged, or for that matter, if somebody within the public simply sees that you're doing an event, which might be, you know, of interest to them. Um, and I guess part of that is in hand in hand is, what are you? What can you be doing? And I know some of you have done this in terms of engaging your chapter with other organizations in the local community. Um, that's sort of part and parcel of helping promote the Fulbright brand. Um, we know that in lots of cases, when you go outside the academic world, people are not necessarily all that familiar with Fulbright, or they don't really know what it is or how it works. Um, and for that matter, we think that in, in a number of cases, people who are alumni but are not necessarily coming from a campus setting may not be aware that, in fact, there's a national alumni organization with chapters uh, that they could be joining. So we think this notion of working with other organizations in the community helps you attract people who may not be familiar with what you're doing, but also helps promote sort of the Fulbright brand and the ideal of what Fulbright is all about. Um, you know, I don't think Fulbright's a household word in the United States, but in lots of cases we hope that it, it could be. And it's sort of in keeping with, as all of you know, Fulbright has been rebranded. We have a new logo. We have a refreshed marketing strategy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at ways the program can become more, more known than it is throughout the community. So the question that we ask you is, can you think creatively of organizations that, that might have similar interests to things that you're doing, uh, whether it's a, a civic organization, whether it's a, um, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, 
whether it's a media outlet, um, whether it's, it's, it's a large employer within the community, um, certainly, certainly the campuses in your community that are engaged with Fulbright, but perhaps there are some that are not. Um, that's certainly something to look at. Um, so we ask you to be creative and think through how can you sort of broaden the base of Fulbright, broaden people's perception of what it is and how they become engaged with it. Um, you know, we're not that far off from the 75th anniversary, which will celebrate in uh, 2021. And we hope that lots of what you're doing now will, um, you know, help us, in fact, grow toward, toward that year, which will be a hallmark year. Um, we, so we talked about the Young Professionals Network. I know some of you have done Fulbright in the Classroom, which is great, uh, a way of engaging alumni uh, with the K-12 school districts, um, both as a way of, again, sort of broadening the base of Fulbright, and letting people get a sense of what it is, what it does, what its ideals are. But even for that matter, um, helping students, helping teachers understand that, in fact, uh, at some point down the road, uh, and maybe even 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 uh, more quickly than that, for a, a teacher or their students could become part of the Fulbright Network. Um, you know, we often hear of, of students who got turned on to Fulbright because they met somebody when they were in the 11th grade and that person had a Fulbright and told them what a great experience that was. So, you know, we... we we love for you to think about Fulbright in the Classroom. Uh, we have ongoing Fulbright teacher programs as part of the State Department's menu of programs, so that, that certainly benefits. Uh, we're always happy to connect um, Fulbright alumni who are teachers uh, with this young with this um, Fulbright in the Classroom activity. So that seems to be uh, a growing area that you could think about things that you could be doing. Um, I think further on in the slides, we talk about what used to be called um, speakers bureaus. Now it's being coined Fulbright Forum. Uh, some of you have done this. Uh, this is a great way, again, to, to help connect Fulbright to the broader community. Um, it could be a way of fundraising. It simply could be a way of bringing in a prominent speaker on a given topic or do this more than once a year um, as a way of, again, connecting Fulbright to the larger world area of world affairs or whatever the topic might be that would be of an interest not only to your, your American alumni and to your visiting mentees, but to the general public as well. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say with all of this is to think creatively about what is of interest to your American alumni? Uh, what kinds of things would they like to see the chapters do? And then go from there. And I also think that what I've been describing so far, um, we hope is also of interest to your visiting, your visiting scholars and your foreign students. Um, and they then can, can easily be in, included in these kinds of things as well. Um, we also talk about diversity. That's an important part of what we're trying mm -hmm. to do, both within Fulbright as we recruit participants, but also in terms of how is that then followed through in terms of bringing more diverse alumni into your chapter, into your organization. Um, so that, again, that means reaching out to diverse kinds of organizations that might help, might help you find diverse alumni who are not part of the chapter, perhaps, but also helps you broaden the base of what you're doing and helps other organizations that are not familiar with Fulbright or not familiar with what you do uh, become partners in your activities to, to serve your chapter clientele. Um, part of that also is volunteerism. And if there are ways that, that, that that's an important part of what we're doing within Fulbright, both during a grant and after. Uh, so the, again, if there are organizations in your community that could benefit from a partnership with your chapter, um, you know, think about that as, as 
again, another way of, of engaging. Um, we talked previously in, in previous years about doing an activity that has a value-added kind of con component to it. And we still think that's really important. Um, whatever kind of activity you're planning for your American alumni or for your visiting Fulbrighters, uh, we hope it's something that they couldn't quite do on their own. And the examples that we've given you, which in a sense are repeats from previous years, stuff many of you have done before, is if you're going to a sporting event, uh, that's fine. But we hope it's more than that. We hope it's an example um, was in California, uh, people attending a basketball game and having somebody from that basketball team coming out and even talking with them uh, a bit about sport itself, um, about history of the team, um, something that the, 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 the participants, your Fulbrighters, would not know. Um, or if you're doing a trip to a museum, we hope that there's something that part of that is a behind the scenes tour or discussion um, of that museum, which enhances the, the, the um, you know, your participants attending or going to that museum um, in terms of what they see, but also tells them something that they don't necessarily know or could not have done on their own. Um, you know, we've seen that with, with visits to different kinds of, of diverse communities um, within your city, within your state. Um, you know, we've seen Fulbrighters taking to, um, you know, during, let's say, African American History Month, taking to an African American church. Well, that's great. Uh, they joined a service, perhaps, with the local congregants, and that's great. Um, but having, um, you know, being part of the sermon or hearing from, um, you know, the local mm -hmm. the pastor, having a meal with the congregants. Um, again, something that, that enhances the experience and is something that uh, the Fulbrighters would not necessarily do on their own. And I think lots of you are creative in thinking about that, and we encourage that. Um, and we want to talk a bit about... Um, process and reporting requirements and things like that. Um, I guess let me ask first, though, um, are there questions in terms of the kinds of things I've been talking about? I have one question. Um, this is Kristen Swancher from Minnesota. And I'm curious a little bit about, um, I'm new to the board this year, so if that um, helps you to understand where my question is coming from, and, and I will definitely discuss this with our experienced and our new board members as well. But I'm curious how much we're in the business of development, like you mentioned, seeking funds and developing partnerships. Um, and I'm also a little bit curious, are there any guidelines that you put out kind of suggesting or mentoring, shaping the kinds of partnerships that are developed or that we should be seeking? Um, I guess two answers. Um, the partnership or the men or the 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 you know the, the arrangement that you're thinking that you might be thinking about, you know, should be something that that's a value to both your both of the your your partner organization and to your chapter. Um, I don't know that there's, that there's, that there's, you know, specifically more than that. Um, you know, there's certainly like, like organizations out there, you know, world affairs councils who have international interests, um, United Nations associations, chapters, um, a stronger partnership with your local university or, or community college and their international activities. Um, so it could be relating to international in the, con in the, in the, pers in, in the perspective that Fulbright is international, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, you know, it could be, it could be that the partnership is with another service organization that may not be international per se, um, or it's a partnership with another organization that simply has an activity or an interest or an effort 
that you think would be of interest to your members. So it's pretty broadly defined. Um, the second part of your question, I guess, in terms of the partnerships and fundraising, um, I know there are parameters into what you could actually do in the context of raise, raising funds. So if you're looking to do that, my suggestion would be I'm going to refer you back to uh, the Association National Office and find out uh, what kind of guidelines exist in terms of, um, you know, your ability to raise funds. Um, it, it sort of depends on sort of how you're looking in that. Are you raising funds in terms of, of a general activity, let's say, where you, you have an event open to the public and you charge an admission, or are you looking to simply have some organization cost share the program with you in kind, they, they you know, whether it's, it's cash uh, or whether it's in kind where someone has offered you tickets at a reduced rate or has offered you, you know, a, a venue to host the event for a reduced rate or for free of charge. So there's, there's those kinds of things. Um, lots of chapters have done that well and continue to do that. I guess when you talk about development, that to me sort of sounds like raising funds for something perhaps beyond the specific event that you're looking at organized by the chapter. And for that kind of thing, I could refer you back to the national office. Okay, thanks. That helped to clarify. Good. Um, David, I have a question. I'm Elaine Potaker. I'm the president of the main chapter. I have two questions for you. Uh, one involves the um, the interest in the grant uh, seeking extra monies for the chapter. Um, I'm going to piggyback on Kristen's comments. I don't find any guidelines that are available. I had a conversation with um, a couple of people from National the other day, and we were considering seeking extra grant funds to be able to involve. We are a big geographical state, as you know, and uh, we wanted to see if we could involve rural areas to a conference event in the coming year that involved from farm to healthy body, looking at the cycle from the earth to our table. And we were gonna involve schools and so forth. As we got into looking into the extra monies we might solicit, we really saw few guidelines and we we didn't proceed further. Uh, and in my conversation uh, with John, uh, he suggested, well, you know, since we are, to use corporate terms, a subsidiary, uh, these were not his words, these are mine, of national, we really need to look at this before we did that. So that's one thing. The second thing, the second question, so what I'm saying is piggyback, backing on Kristen's, uh, who was new to the board, uh, I as president who have been involved with Fulbright in our chapter since 2008, would like to see something that guides us in terms of soliciting extra funds. Uh, the other, the other thing is, as I read the proposal guidelines for 2019 through 2020, I, I, was, uh, I looked at the Young Professional Initiative, recruiting and engaging individuals who have come back, students as an example, who have come back from Fulbright opportunities. Frankly, David, we can be as creative as we can be. A challenge to us is that we don't get the, and I know this has been discussed in DC, we don't get the lists of returning student Fulbrighters, the ETAs and the others. And I realize there are problems with privacy, but at the conference two years ago, a number of chapters suggested that we ask individuals who are receiving a Fulbright award to agree <clears throat> to give their 
information when they return so that we could um, integrate them in our activities, not necessarily push them into joining, but please share your experiences with us. So IIE, and I know because I'm, I'm saying this because I know Jordan is there right now and you are there right now, we can be creative, but we need this data, we need this information. And we're about to approach October. As I write the grant, which I, I am doing, and it's about 85% done, I'm challenged to figure out how am I going to find those people? And we not need that information from IIE. What can you suggest that you can do for us to get that information? It's a, it's a good question. Let me address that first, and then we'll talk more about the, sort of the, the extra support relating to development. Um, David, do you want me issue. to jump in? What was that? Uh, do you want me, me to jump in and, and talk about the, the, the returning grantees? Um, sure, I'm, sure. I mean, I've, I've got something that I just talked with John about, but but go ahead. Um, so one thing I did. Um, so you're right that the privacy is an issue, and so we we don't have as of now we don't have email addresses that we can readily share with everyone. But we do. I mean, all of our grant, every Fulbright U.S. student and every Fulbright U.S. scholar is published in an online directory on our website. So their contact information is there is not there, but everything, you know, all the other information is there. So we do publicize who our Fulbright grantees are on an annual basis. And I think the scholar list comes out every year in October. So right now the 1920 cohort is about to go on or is has either departed or will be soon, and all of their information will be on our website in October. I think that the student information comes online around January. Um, so that information is there. I do understand um, about asking the question about sharing, sharing um, their, giving us permission to share their email address specifically with the Fulbright Association. I think right now in in this day and age we have to be very um specific about how we might ask for that uh like who would we, who we would be sharing it with their contact information and so i think we and eca and the fulbright association national chapter need to talk a little bit more about what that looks like in terms of asking for that permission but everything except their email address is available on um on our website and i i think for for um um for scholars it is like usually a very quick google search to find an email address um i know for students maybe that's a little bit more challenging but i just wanted to let you know that there is public information and that we can continue the conversation about asking for permission to share specifically with the fulbright association um if, if i may if I may, I'd like to add something to what I just said. We're trying to find other avenues to find them. I see Lane again. Um, we actually have asked institutions where they're returning, and believe it or not, they they don't know either. So although we have faculty uh, who are returning Fulbright alumni where, that we can find more easily, we can't find the students. That is a real problem, and it's a problem that has uh, been a problem for as, as many years as I've been on the board, and also mentioned and um, lamented upon at the conference as much as two years ago. I'm just sharing that with you, and I will defer to others. So I could just this, uh, uh, if I this pause. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. Excuse me. David has something to say, and then I will respond to this also. David, do you want to say so, what you want? Yes. Um, one thing we're looking at as a possibility, um, because we've had, had this conversation, in fact, as recently as a couple of days ago, of what's the best way to communicate with the Americans while they're on their grants, or or while you know, there was some talk about. Would we talk with them or meet with them before they leave? That's very complicated because grants are finalized 
over the span of months, not weeks. Um, so it's very hard to give you a list of people who are going. Um, and I was talking about this with John. But one thing we, sh- we, we want to at least take a look at to see if this might work is to have a letter sent either from the national office or even from your chapters, which I might be able to send out for you to the Americans on assignment. And it's a way of, inter- of the, you then introducing yourself to that, to that, uh, that American Fulbrighter who's from Michigan and said, by the way, you know, hope your, hope your grant is going well. We are the Michigan Fulbright chapter. We'd love to engage with you when you return home. Here's who we are, blah, blah, blah. That's the way of perhaps of connecting with grantees. Um, you maybe do that in November, which reaches literally all the students because they're all on, on nine-month grants and reaches all the Americans who are there for this, a semester. Maybe you then do that again in March for the people that are on spring semester grants. But it's a way of communicating to that American while they're on the grant, talking about your chapter, encouraging them to join, hopefully, to get back in touch with you and giving giving them your reference points and that that opens the door for two-way communication. That's a great idea, David. And, um, you know, we wouldn't hit them with joining immediately, but as we all know, who those of us who, who have had Fulbrights, Sometimes we come back and there's no recognition within the institution that we even were away. And I think that being able to do that and embrace that person that comes back would be marvelous. So please, if you can do something in that regard, it would be great. Perhaps something like Los Angeles. Yes, Los Angeles, the chapter Greater Los Angeles, I think did have an informal arrangement a number of years ago where they had a a template that they provided to IIE that IIE was kind enough to send out two departing U.S. Fulbrights and to let them know that of the existence of the association and to congratulate them and to uh, inform them that they will be welcome to join the, the chapter upon their return. So there could be something that would be along those lines maybe even one letter that lists every single chapter that exists at the time that the awards are granted before they're leaving U.S. shores might uh, really open some eyes. So, Super um, idea. This is Shaz. Um, the, the, the list that uh, Jordana is referencing is, 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 is public information, but since you guys cannot contact those students, it's really not relevant in order to have any information that way, right? Without, uh, you guys want emails so that you can actually advertise your events and programs. The last time we did, we got returned US alumni lists, David, was in 2016. Um, And so on and off in different years, we've gotten them. There's no consistency in which year we get them but we have not gotten them for the last three years. So that's two things. The third is that we have talked about this writing letter. Uh, The last time we did a letter writing campaign through our chapters as well as FA was the summer of 2013. If some of you have been in the chapter um, and involved with the chapter since then, you will remember that we did that. The presidents wrote a letter we wrote a letter and a lot of returned alums found out about the chapters and joined. The problem is um, there is no set policy and there's no consistency and there is no, um, we've been told that IIE in the de- pre-departure uh, um, orientations includes information about the Fulbright Association. But then these departing students get a whole packet full of stuff that they don't bother reading and probably recycle. So we, w- there is an issue. Um, frankly, I don't, I'm not positive right now that we will get the returned alum lists. And I don't want our chapters to have this hope and expectation that they will get something in November 
until a certain policy is set by ECA and then IIE implementing some of that and us implementing some of that. I'm sorry, I hope that makes it clear. I just want it to be very... Well, let me just, Chaz, let me just add to that because right. I think it's, you, you've, you've talked about a number of different things. I don't foresee giving the association the list of, of returned grantees for a variety of reasons. I don't think that will happen. But it, but it but it seems to me and and we're not as excited about you contacting grantees before they depart for a number of reasons, including the fact that the lists are very incomplete, literally until August September when the final groups leave final participants leave, and also as she has mentioned, they are so inundated with information about everything they need to deal with when they start their grants that they're very really not focused on what might be of interest to them a year later. That's why I think the concept of sending something to them after they've gotten to their assignments and settled in is much more beneficial and I think will have much more impact. And I don't see a reason we need to work this out, but I don't see a reason why, um, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't take that list of that group of grantees on assignment and parse it along the same lines as we do for the visiting grantees, so we know who belongs to what jurisdiction and what chapter, and simply send something to them, as I said, in November uh, or in March, that says, here's who we are, we, you know, we look forward to you coming back, and we, we would welcome your, your engagement with us. So I do think that's doable, even though we would need to work out the details. Well, what about sending it along with the certificate that they receive when they're completing their Fulbright letter with the association letterhead? Um, I don't specifically know when they it's, get there. I, I can talk about that. Please do. Jordana. Um, yeah, they get their certificate um, upon completion of, um, they have to submit a final report um, in order to get their certificate. And once they um, they do that, we send them certificates on a quarterly basis. And I'm gonna double check the language, the cover letter of the language that accompanies their certi certificate, but I think it does give a link to the Fulbright Association. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, uh, my question was, what about having a distinct Fulbright Association letter on, dis on Fulbright Association letterhead signed by John Bader? So we do this electronically now. They get electronic signatures that uh -huh. they down, um, electronic um, certificates that they download from a portal from the, the Fulbright portal that they work with us in. Um, so I'd have to look at like I think ECA and I we would need to talk with like what that would actually look like if it was a standalone letter. But they we do reference the Fulbright Association um, as part of a way to stay engaged um, with a link. For, uh, so they do have that information when they get the certificate. Uh, yeah, this a letter from John would be appreciated. This is Andre in New Mexico. Why not just uh, local alumni chapter on the um, Andre, we can't hear you. Um, and and for the interest of time, I was wondering if we could hold the questions till the end and complete sure. the presentation. Because you you know the, the most of the questions are about lists, the visiting Fulbrighter lists, the incoming US lists. Let's leave this till the end, if you don't mind, and continue with the um, presentation. Okay, very good. So before Jordana talks about um, some of the processes and, and, and so on and some of the requirements, are there any other quick questions about um, programming that you've got? Um, uh, David, I asked you a second question about um, the what what are the guidelines piggybacking on Kristen's question, what are the guidelines for applying for other grants that might um, extend the reach of our activities? But I'm willing to leave that to the end. I just want to make sure it's in in your thinking sure. before we let's, depart. Let's leave that and remind me if we don't if we don't address it, but we will. I will, thank you. So um, we, we go on to the program activities. Um, we've done all, a lot of that. Let, okay, David, let's, uh, I'm going to just uh, move on. We know the focus. Um, we talked about the community engagement, young professional networking. Mm -hmm. We've talked about all that. 
Um, this was an example that you referenced, David, the second harvest food was, bank in, in the U.S. It was just a very good example of, um, of volunteerism and food riders engaging with this this um, food bank. In many, and I mean, this is something that a lot of you could do if you're interested, but this, this was particularly successful. I mean, you could find an activity that is in your state, an organization that, like, I know the Arizona chapter has done a lot with Habitat for Humanity. Um, there's so the DC chapter has done a lot with the food bank and the Thanksgiving meals, the uh, the, the oh, preparation of meals in food kitchens and things like that for homeless uh, shelters. Uh, you could find a cause, and alumni are really excited to be engaged in those areas. Uh, so this is an example of an activity in Minnesota. Um, so then we go on to Fulbright in the classroom. We talked about that's uh, it's still ongoing. We would like you to consider doing more different exciting things. I'll be happy to share this uh, this slideshow with uh, with chapter leadership so that you can look at it at a later time. These are just examples of the four chapters and what they did, their creativity with uh, um, their alumni as well as the visiting Fulbrighters. Um, you need allies. We talk about World Affairs Councils. We talk about teacher associations, civic organizations. We talk about partnerships with um, local institutions that have uh, uh, K-12 programs. We talk about um, even, you know, partnerships with organizations like IIE. You know, if you're in one of the anchor cities, that you would have an IIE uh, or, uh, office uh, to work with. Um, what else? Then we have um, the Fulbright Forum, and um, that is just rebranding the speakers bureau and most of you have been getting calls by john about how you could possibly plan such a uh an event under the fulbright forum banner uh these are some examples of what that looks like um another example is uh here new hampshire chapter had um a couple of three series of uh speaker bureau type events that they organized in the spring um that could be rebranded as the fulbright forum for example ncac our national capital area chapter had a partnered with the national press club to present a panel discussion you know reporting on real news in you know in an alternative facts uh, era what that looks like you could have round tables you could have roundtable discussions with country-specific projects. Um, they, they also had one, NCAC had one with Hungary. Um, so that's what, what, what existing programs you're already doing for alumni engagement could be put under the banner of Fulbright Forum. And then you partner, the best partnership with the Fulbright Forum model is with the institutions in your area. Um, they normally love partnering on such if you have a great speaker on such platforms where you have a speaker, they'll give you space, they'll get, you can advertise to faculty and students to come and listen to that talk. It could be a brown bag type thing where people bring their lunch and listen to a speaker. So these are just the ideas that you don't have to go out of your way to create something new. Many of you already have a speaker's uh, bureau forum type platform, just utilize that. but you know, for branding purposes, use the same platform. Um, and then we have, okay, deadlines. Um, Jordan, Jordana, I will let you pitch in for this. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so um, in addition to talking about deadlines, um, which are very important, I. Um, I'll get to that in a, in a little bit, but I did want to just stress that, you know, as Fulbright Association chapters, you are recipients of U.S. government funding. 
And so as chapter leaders, you're essentially stewards of taxpayer dollars. So it's really important to be cognizant of that because there are many regulations we have to follow um, when using taxpayer money. And I think um, David touched on, on a lot of this already, but um, just making sure that the your chapter activities um, are, you can never use the money that you're receiving um, for advocacy events or anything related to advocacy. So I did um, want to make that clear. You also can't use this money for alcohol or something that we would consider purely entertainment. Um, so like David was talking about the baseball game exa example, adding something extra that makes it a networking event um, and makes it really meaningful for U.S. alum or for alumni of the program to gather and, and do something cultural or with the community, but it can't be purely entertainment. Um, um, Jordana, can I ask you a question? Yeah. This is Elaine, Elaine Potaker again from the main chapter. Uh -huh. uh, one of the um, items that um, is on the list as a possibility for requesting funds is materials. In my history with the chapter, we've never requested anything, but there is a reason on an upcoming event, this Farm to Healthy Body, where we might send uh, postcards and other kinds of information, and we're, we're unsure of what materials means. Would materials cover um, a postcard, publicity, whatever? And if we were very, um, moderate about what we asked for, $100, $200. I mean, is that it, would you explain what materials means? Um, I might need to look into that definition a little bit more with our, with um, my colleagues who work on the grants and contracts um, part of our team, because I don't want to give you misinformation. So sure, I might... Is Jordan, uh, I can deal. Yeah. I can handle that part because we we, we okay. deal with that all the time. It is it is um it is material for flyers and um, any kind of print material that the chapter uses to um, advertise and distribute uh, for the purpose of its events, its programs. It, it also mm -hmm. can include some some business expense of the chapter board, like business cards or um, some kind of meeting expense if, if, if large number of printed documents are needed for a, a business meeting. So exactly what you said, Elaine, postcards, things like that. But in moderation, you know, you can't say, oh, we're going to design a fancy brochure <laughs> and a magazine and it's going to cost $10,000 yeah. to distribute. <laughs> There are restrictions on that. Shaz was, Shaz, was that you? Yeah. It's good to hear your voice, Shaz. Oh, hi. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you. Yeah, yeah. Been, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. That's very really helpful because we had no idea what that meant. Yeah, Yeah, and I think just to add on that, you know, we it, exactly what Shaz mentioned and what you were talking about in terms of postcards for an event, et cetera. But, you know, um, you know some people would might think like an iPad to help assist an event. That's obviously not a material or equipment that we could no, um, support, like but but things that help to advertise and promote uh, an event um, it is acceptable. But I will share one thing. The uh, so, like some of our chapters do have electronics, which they have bought from the funds, their own uh, membership rebate funds or funds that they've raised themselves from their members uh, through, you know, special donors. NCAC has an iPad, They, but it's not bought from grant funds. It's bought uh -huh. from your own discretionary funds of the chapter. And they use that uh, at their events. When new members sign up, they have a way of signing members up right there and then at the event. So you can buy an iPad or any equipment but it cannot be from U.S. government funds. It cannot be from the chapter grant uh, funds, is, is to be more specific. And, and I think what Shaz brings up is actually really important that we, we don't, we need you to have very clear accounting of these funds. You cannot 
commingle this chapter grant money with your discretionary money because we need very clear reporting from you and Shaw's gives you templates um, of how you can report this and so we really need you know that money to be separated and clearly accounted for so that you can report into Shaw's um, and this is really important because IIE has a contract with um, the Fulbright Association National Office and there are requirements that Shaw's has to fulfill in order to continue receiving this money. In order for Shaw's to fulfill the requirements to sustain this um, to sustain this program, she has to have all of the documentation from the chapters in time by the deadline she sets because she can't then meet our deadlines um, without the information that you provide into her. So please make sure that you are providing all of the detailed information in the reporting templates that she provides by the deadline that she gives you because this will allow the program to keep running. This is Amelia Montes from Nebraska. I just want to know, is there a specific, um, is there specific paperwork given to us to fill out documentation or do we make it up as we go? No, we have specific forms. There will be event okay. summaries. Once the chapter grant is allocated, you will get an updated 2019-2020 uh, activity uh, event summary uh, template. It has, okay, a, it has a budget detail uh, box as well as a, a narrative portion to it. And uh, you okay. are also able to submit photographs, which are great to tell the story of the event you just had. Okay, great, great, yeah. So David and Shaz, is there anything I missed that you would like me to, to continue talking about? I guess I would just reiterate the importance of timeliness um, in terms of finances and in terms of reports themselves. Um, you know, Shaz was mentioning photographs, one of the things that's really helpful to to my office is for you to do a timely event summary, uh, which we hope we can get within a week or two weeks at the latest after the event takes place, because I'm able then to take that story and send that up to chain of command to my assistant secretary to say, look at the great activity that took place in Pittsburgh or Lincoln or Madison or Miami. Um, as a way of demonstrating how we're reaching out to alumni, but also how ECA funds are used. Um, so the more that you can share with us, the better we're able to, to promote the success of what you're doing. Um, and it's really beneficial to everybody and it's a real win-win. Um, so the, the extent that you can do that, um, that's tremendously helpful. Okay. And if it's a high level event that you know that there's a lot of press or different partners and organizations involved, if you can highlight that to, if you can point it out to me before in advance of the event, just as a reminder, I can let David know the, of the important activity. And so it's suddenly on their radar and they can see maybe someone from State Department could participate or attend the activity. I mean, that's so. that's one of the beauties of the enhanced website um, that's in place now, including a calendar of events where um, the national office is able to put events that that your that you chapters have scheduled on that calendar, so we're able to look frequently to see what's coming up, and you know, is it an event that we might have an assistant secretary in the area or somebody from the Fulbright Scholarship Board or someone else who might be able to actually attend the event. So that's that's clearly a bonus, but for that to happen means that we need good information from you about upcoming events that the National Office can then put on this calendar. I think, I think we're done with the presentation part and we can answer questions at this point. Well, I just, this is Elaine again. Um, I would like to talk about, first of all, thank you for this presentation. David, I've heard your name. I never met you and um, I, you might, I'll probably meet you in DC. 
in, uh, in October. I'm Good. looking forward to that. Shaz, I know you're busy. I know there's lots going on there. I appreciate that you're here on this meeting. And Jordana, I never met you. Um, I think all these pieces are important. I know how busy you all are. And I know as I'm a chapter president, and um, it's amazing how much work there is to make this work. So thank you for this, because it did clarify in my mind a few things that I wasn't sure of. But you know what we do need, and we don't need to talk about it now, is I am not clear about how we've always talked about how we can rely on other funds besides national funds to do our work. I think it's absolutely incredibly important for our succession plan as a chapter and our future. So um, we don't want to rely on just, not just, but the um, national funds to do our work. We think that we have to solicit other funds and we almost went in that direction and then I cut it off. I said, don't do it because we weren't sure how we could be as a subsidiary in you know using terms you know in quotes of national how we could sign any agreement and I'll give you an example of how that could work the farm to healthy body um, event that we're having this fall this will help other chapters that are listening in I think we wanted to uh, we're a big state um, any any chapter like New Hampshire, Vermont, whatever, or ge geographic, we have a geographical challenge, and we wanted to be able to maybe extend this wonderful event to rural communities. It might even be taking it on the road, but then we realized, or I realized, that hey, we can't sign any agreements with an organization like Trader Joe's that has a possible uh, grant for us, or maybe even Shaw's or Hannaford's, because we'd have to go to national to do it. Now, on the grant guidelines for 2019 to 20, um, it says that it encourages participation with other organizations we are for our grant proposal for next year working with several other NGOs community organizations but here was an area that was really unclear to us and it's not to say that you haven't done something that we need it just means that let's talk about if we're going to ask for these extra funds what are the guidelines? So with Kristen's earlier comment, who's new to a board, I'm not new to a board. I've been on the board since 2008 in many roles. I need to know that. I don't want to, to compromise national. I love Fulbright and all of our board members love Fulbright, just probably like everybody else is here. I want to do the right thing, help me to do the right thing. Do you do you have your do you, who signs your checks? <laughs> well, you know, right now I'm signing my checks because okay. my okay. my treasurer is on leave of absence, so I'm the interim okay. treasurer. Okay, so there there you you are the signing authority on a certain level for certain things. Do you have a 501c3 letter from the IRS that spells out, you know, to the chapter what can be can be um, done with that that uh, status the 501c3 status that spells out some of the types of things that chapters can do but I know that's not the level of detail you you're asking for but there are so some I'm just, I'm just asking for um, uh, Elaine Elaine I, I have all the answers to this sorry I didn't mean to interrupt um, I'm gonna let David say something but I will give you a very clear answer uh, which which will clarify things. I have been giving chapters these clear answers. They're in the handbook as well. Uh, David, you want to say something? Well, just so some of this is historical and some of it is evolving. Um, you know, at some point there was there was some reference to say, well, there's also two types of 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 
support that you might be raising, if it's in, if it's in kind, where someone's giving you free free space for an event, or they're reducing tickets, or whatever the case might be, that's pretty straightforward. That's easy to do. And lots of chapters to to do that. If you're talking about funding an event, like you're talking about Elaine, in terms of um, going to um, you know, to Trader Joe's or someone like that, my understanding, and Shaz can clarify this with what she has to provide you, is the chapters had some authority to do that up to a certain level of funding. I think it was $10,000, perhaps. I mean, chapters can raise up to $50,000 and stay in their affiliate subsidiary status under us as the parent organization. And all this is very clear in the chapter handbook, which is under the chapters tab on our webpage. You go into resources, you will see all the forms and different things uploaded there. Um, it's so you can raise money um, from Trader Joe's or local communities or institutions. Whatever you do, as long as you're below 50000 in your bank account for that year, you're safe. And most of our chapters don't have that kind of money. But you're, you can supplement the chapter grant. But just remember that when you report, like Jordana said, you're, for this chapter grant, you can uh, point out in your budget summary that you got in-kind support, like David is saying, of X amount of dollars for space or for tickets. But in the actual breakdown of the grant funds and your report to us, you will only have to explain that the 5,000 that were allocated to you, how did you spend them? But fundraising and um, sponsorship dollars that you can raise are, are, are all 50 and below for affiliate groups. And let me make one other point, which I think is accurate. Um, the 5013 status that Jeff's talking about relates to the national office on behalf of all the chapters. Chapters, as far as I understand, do not go out and, and become 5013 organizations yeah, of their own not right. It's not separate. It's it's part of a federation, and you get you you have that that your that authority based on being an being an affiliated chapter of the national office, the national organization. Which is why you guys submit. And uh, you file the 990 e postcards and send us copies that you filed them. That's all to do with the larger status of the organization and all the affiliate organizations under us. Does that make sense, Elaine? It does, um, Shaz, and I appreciate that. Um, yes. And I, I, one more thing I want to say, this chapter, uh, this was another chapter asked this, and since we're talking about taxes, I might as well address this as well. Um, state tax is something that chapters for tax, a state tax exemption, each chapter has to individually apply themselves for their chapter in their state. That has nothing to do with us. We do not file for the chapter. Our federal status, you guys are all covered under. Um, and you're also covered under our um, insurance for directors. The chapters, all the board members of chapters are also covered under our insurance policy or leadership um, that we annually renew. But state tax, some states do not give chapters that state tax exemption because they don't fall under a certain restricted category. And I think Elaine main chapter is one of them that, you know, educational organizations are not found in the types of categories they've listed. But most states do give you state exemption. NCAC has it, New York, our greater New York chapter, the Chicago chapter, I think the LA chapter and the Northern California chapters, many of our chapters, I might be missing some, have applied and gotten that at the state level. But it depends on what your state laws are for taxation. And that is something you guys have to pursue yourselves. Yeah, um, Shaz, well, not to take up any more time. Um, as you know, uh, 
this would involve a legislative change and we'll need your help as we've discussed to uh, make that happen because we're paying state tax on any event that we have which drains our budget and um, we are cooperating by the way with the World Affairs Council which is the other flagship institution of um, the IIE uh, and in June of 2020 and uh, they have the same problem they do not get any relief from state ta taxes I'm wondering from the people who are participating in this call if they are if the board members or their leaders other than board members like presidents know if they are paying state taxes on any of their events for I don't know um, buying materials for luncheons for dinners and so forth so if any of you want to speak up it would be good to talk about it uh, Amelia Montes from Nebraska I I will have to look into that and get back to you although we have had um, Fulbright workshops on the University of Nebraska Lincoln campus that's been funded by the university I don't know um, well if it's funded by the university those are state dollars as well perhaps that's something that the FA national office can can look at uh, systemically and and I'll work with each of you to look through to see what the what the requirements are in your given state and see what what you know how that can be addressed yes David it, this is a slow bleed I don't know no, how I else to describe it no it's I appreciate that bleed. sure well sometimes sometimes you can pick sometimes you can pick a major vendor and if you if you uh, provide them a copy of, of a you know the 501c3 letter and fill out their paperwork for waiver of the state tax uh, portion of the bill they will sometimes lawfully waive that portion of the invoice but not in the state of Maine <laughs> okay the, I, I think we can we can discuss the tax issue offline because I think there might be other people uh, having questions Sure, that's fine. Well, I have a, this may be far off, but I think um, I'm going, I was um, maybe led astray in thinking that this was also going to be a meeting about um, how to look at applications. And so let me understand that when we look at applications, we're also interested in seeing if the applicant is interested in being involved with Fulbright after their year? Um, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, what do you mean by that? You 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 mean applications of uh, Fulbrighters? Yes, I'll be reviewing applications this fall. So, so are you are you are you thinking that there's some reference to alumni? organizations and activities during the application process? Yes. Um, and yeah, there really wouldn't be because at that point they're only applicants and they won't even, you know, we don't, we really wouldn't raise the issue with okay. someone until they actually become a, 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 a selectee or a grantee. A gra yeah. I see. Okay. Not All that right. they, not that they couldn't learn about the fact that there's, that there's a full by organization, because as I okay. said, it's open yeah. to, to, to supporters and friends, not just alumni, but okay. it's not something that we would be doing as part of a, you know, an orchestrated activity. Okay, thank you. But, but, but it does raise a question in the materials that are disseminated to prospective applicants. Is there anything there that alerts them to the fact that they are potential, that they could apply to be members in the Fulbright Association? There probably um, isn't, but but again, we're recruiting them to become full by grantees. It's not really ECA's yeah. role to say, you know, what would would you please think about alumni activities? That's right. You know, you're you're yeah, sort of it's not appropriate. You're several steps yeah. ahead of that. 
Right, right. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I, I would say that our, our general outreach, our messages do talk about being part of like a larger Fulbright network and being right. part of the Fulbright family. And that's one of the benefits to applying for a Fulbright and, and receiving one. So, and then, you know, that could, but I agree that the applicant phase isn't really the right place to, okay. to talk about. Right I can add though, anybody, anyone who yeah, gets a, we do a Fulbright fact sheet, for example, that describes the different Fulbright program activities and who their administrating partners are. And there is a, there is a piece on that document that that refers to the Fulbright Alumni Organization. So, you know, it's in our outreach materials, but we're not yeah. specifically addressing it to each individual okay. applicant as something they should be doing, particularly if they're not a grantee. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave the meeting. I have another engagement, another meeting. So, um, um, I will, it says end of slideshow here. Right. Yeah, so, so thank you so much for joining. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I will, um, I look forward to getting the rest, you know, the slideshow and the notes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, um, this, this is Mary Stanton. I just have, uh, an Hi, idea for hi for increasing the outreach to current grantees and visiting scholars, um, and um, I'm thinking specifically of the workshops that are given. Um, I'm not too sure what the current situation is with them, but I do know when I was on my Fulbright, I had training in the country in India. That would have been a time that. Um, perhaps a little blurb could be added verbally and maybe in some of the materials about uh, the Alumni Association in the um, individual states. I also had a mid-year workshop, which would have been a wonderful time uh, to talk about post-Fulbright experiences when we return to our country. Um, and my third suggestion, or is perhaps the commissions who are probably part of the training when the grantees arrive in the country could also um, mention the um, alumni association. I think that might be a time when the grantees are a little bit more interested in what's going to happen after their grant is over. I think those are possible. Um, it's. I think they'll maybe better off coming from the um, from the national office here or from your chapters. Um, and I'll just say, sort of just in, in, in very general terms, there are 70 Fulbright alumni organizations around the world, um, many of them in Fulbright Commission countries, others in countries where there is no commission, where the program is run by the U.S. Embassy. There are some issues of competition between what's going on in the United States side and what's going on with alumni whether, home, whether at home or hosted by other countries. So it's a bit of a challenge. It's complicated. Um, in some respects, I'll just say this briefly, some places may be more inclined to, to encourage people to join the Fulbright Association in country X rather than in the United States, even to people who are from that country or Americans who are going to that country. So it makes it complicated, and it's not it's mm -hmm. it's not an easy, not a perfect world where there is there's at times some competition for the Fulbright alum to join organization X or Y. So so I think some of your suggestions make sense, but there but it's it's there's complicating factors. That is really helpful information to have. Thank you, David. Sure. Yeah, very helpful. I just have one comment. This is Bob Shaw from from uh, Rhode Island. Um, this, there's clearly been a, a change in focus of the uh, chapter guidelines. You know, um, in terms of spending more time with alums and less emphasis on um, supporting the visiting Fulbrighters. And I'm fine with that. I think it's a good idea. But I do hope that the various institutions, IIE and Fulbright Association, and even the State Department, can figure out better ways of supporting us in that project. Um, getting information about the, the people coming back 
would be really helpful. And rather than just saying we can't do that, uh, think of a better way of getting that information to us so we can actually contact these people and actually then get them involved. So, again, that was my suggestion of having perhaps letters go from chapters or the national office to the American Flow Riders on assignment in the fall. Um, mm -hmm. Because of privacy issues, we're not able to simply say to you, here's a list, here's the contact points. But this, I think, is a, is a good alternative way of reaching them to get them connected to your chapters. And uh, hopefully a lot of them would say, hey, this looks exciting. I'm, I'm you know, having a great time on my Fulbright, and I would like to keep this momentum in place when I get back. And that's a great way to do that. And, and that's what we hope would happen. Hey, how about, this is Andre in New Mexico. Uh, if these returning grantees receive a certificate with a cover letter at the, when they return, uh, why not just CC the local alumni organization just as a heads up? I couldn't hear what he said. On, um, the cover, on, the cover, on the cover letter. Can you CC hear me? In the email that goes out, the alumni chapter board members. No, I think there's, there's various ways of doing that, and we haven't really thought through exactly how that will happen. But, you know, I think a number of these ways may work and we'll figure out what we think is the best way moving forward. Yeah, it seems like the critical point would be, you know, upon their return and when, they, when they're wrapping, when uh, everything is being wrapped up, uh, then, uh, you know, in some fashion, the uh, lo local alumnus, uh, lo alumni organization should get some sort of uh, notification and then whatever happens, happens after that. Right. Well, that's why we're suggesting that you that you get in contact with them early on in their grant and start a conversation. All right. Thank you. Um, and and going to Elaine again, uh, Andre's suggest his comment is is really important. I believe that we want to embrace these people when they come back. All of us who is who are on this call came back from their Fulbright experience, and maybe they had a reception, and maybe they had nothing at all. <laughs> and um, that opportunity to embrace that person coming back is very special to me. I mean, I am, as you are, very committed to Fulbright. I love Fulbright. I want to embrace that person coming back to help them feel they have a community that will surround them because they may not have any any kind of um, reception or something when they come home. So they've had this rock star experience when they've been overseas, but when they come back, it may not be that way. So it is so important David and and Shaws and Jordana, that we get lists. I know you're struggling with that. Let us help you in some way determine that. But I can tell you, as much as we've tried with the institutions, they don't know about these people. So I want to write this into my grant. I want to say, I want to support young professionals, student alumni coming back, help me to do that. And we appreciate that. And that's why I'm saying we want to figure out a way for you to communicate with these grantees while they're on their grants, that you, that you will form a connection with them. So while we probably cannot give you a list with their actual email addresses from A to Z, um, we'll be able to, to work through an arrangement where we get we get letters to them on your behalf and, you know, make those connections so you know who's coming back uh, by the, based on the responses that you get. And I, I just want to add that, that yeah, and I think great. that David and I and Shaz really want to yeah, work on this. We have to we be will. mindful yeah. of the, the, you know, there's general, there is a lot more data protection regulations that we're all held to now after the 
general data protection regulations came out in Europe. And so we just have to be very mindful of all of those regulations. And so that's why it's a little bit of a trickier conversation in terms of the best way for us to get them the information without us automatically sharing email addresses that we don't have permission to share. Yeah, well put. Yes, and we all know that there, it's just impossible to get a complete list. And even the list of the directory uh, names uh, is not even for privacy and national security reasons. We'll never, ever show everyone. Right? For some, you know, some people are off the, off the uh, grid, so to speak. Are they not? <laughs> okay. I might be overstating things. Okay, guys, I think um, it's about, um, I, I want to let uh, Jordana and David go um, at 6.30. I will be sharing this recording and as well as the PowerPoint. Um, I will, um, I, I, I have a, I have some time on Monday and Tuesday. So Elaine, let's resolve that tax issue. Any of you want to call and discuss anything with me, I'll be in the office, feel free. Um, I just had to be out today. Um, I actually went and met the University of Richmond's president and uh, the Virginia Commonwealth University's president. So that was a very interesting um, and the University of Richmond uh, president said, I'd be happy to share our Fulbright alum data with you guys. So, you know, I, I guess maybe it's a good way to go to the universities if you have that personal relationship. Um, but uh, I'll be in the office. So looking forward to working with you guys and helping uh, everyone navigate through these uh, difficult uh, times of proposal writing. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks, Jordana, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We look forward Thank to seeing you in October. October. Yeah, and okay. remember that we're also doing the chapter workshop, so um, I'll follow up with that separately, okay? Good. All right. Great, Take thanks. care. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.